relatives surround Nancy Minty. And they are well deserved. Nancy has received numerous awards for her work. On Capitol Hill with President Jimmy Carter from the American Bar Association and the U.S. Congress and being featured on the Oprah Winfrey Show. <laughs> but that is just a part of the story. The fact is that Nancy has a vision for a just, sustainable, and peaceful world, and she has made that vision a reality here in Los Angeles. As a young attorney with a degree from UCLA Law School, Nancy joined the Los Angeles Catholic Worker Community, a group of young people living in solidarity with the poor on Skid Row and in East Los Angeles. She started a free legal clinic in a Skid Row garage and began to represent the first wave of homeless people in Los Angeles and the immigrant families living in slum housing. Her clinic became the inner city law center, and their groundbreaking litigation established the rights of the homeless and won millions of dollars in restitution for families living in deplorable housing. Money, however, does not solve all the problems. After two decades heading the inner city law center, Nancy realized that money was not permanently lifting people out of poverty. People needed good jobs to stay above the poverty line, and the cost of education was preventing young people from serving the poor as lawyers and doctors. So she started Uncommon Good to help disadvantaged minority children get the education they need in order to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty, and to help young lawyers and doctors repay their educational loans so that they could devote their careers to serving the poor. Because Nancy also recognized that environmentalism and social justice were inextricably linked, uncommon good launched a number of environmental justice initiatives. Today, if you should go to the offices of Uncommon Good, just behind the United Methodist Church here in Claremont on Foothill, you would find the whole Earth Building, another of Nancy's imaginative ideas which has become a reality, constructed entirely from on-site Earth by hundreds of people, including Claremont College students. The building is powered by solar energy, surrounded by a beautiful native plant garden. It is internationally recognized as a model of sustainability, warm in winter, cool in summer, impervious to earthquake, fire, or flood. Visitors from every continent have flocked to the whole of the building to learn how to create safe, affordable, environmentally friendly buildings in their own communities. And from that building, Uncommon Good carries out programs in urban agriculture, education, health, green building, and the environment. Nancy exemplifies all the brain power, determination, energy, hard work, and enthusiasm that are essential to bringing about social change. It is a great honor to introduce our major initiative speaker tonight, Nancy Minty. Thank you, and thank you, Janet, for that lovely introduction and for all of the help that you've given us over these many years as a member of our Uncommon Circle. We really appreciate you. Uh, it's a great honor to be singled out by the Pilgrim Place community. Uh, I am so aware of your extraordinary lives of service. I think that the true power centers of the world aren't 
Washington, D.C., Wall Street. No, I think there are places like this where extraordinary people gather. I'd like to thank my uh, board member, Michael Fay, who is here tonight with his wife, Emily, and the chair of my board, uh, Tim Dillon, uh, who is also here with us this evening. Those of you who get our uh, newsletter uh, have, the, have had the chance to read the riveting story of Tim's great career as a champion of the people. Without my wonderful board members uh, like uh, Michael and Tim and Charles Bayer, a member of the community here, um, Uncommon Good would not exist. I also want to thank all of you who support um, our organization. Many of you here do. Um, I want to especially thank the Denims, uh, for whom part of our whole earth building has been named, um, and the Ambrogis, who gave us an extraordinary uh, contribution that helped launch Uncommon Good 14 years ago. I want to congratulate the Napier winners. Um, thank you for the beautiful work that you're doing for our world. I want to especially thank uh, the winners, Bianca Shu and Sharon Jan, for the writing program that they created, which has given a lifelong gift of literacy and joy of writing to the children in our program. But most of all this evening, I want to talk to the students who didn't win anything. I think that you're probably the most powerful people in this room tonight. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. I can relate to your situation. You know, when I graduated, I didn't get any awards. Um, I was a, a nobody, really. Um, I hadn't even been a very good student in law school. Uh, problem was, I didn't think like a lawyer. You know, lawyers think very logically and linearly, you know, from A to B to C, carefully following precedent, you know. And I didn't think like that. I, you know, I would start at A and say, okay, I want to go to B, but if I skip ahead to D and I stack two Ds on top of each other, I've got a B, and I've got all the inherent energy of two Ds, so I'm going to go A to D. Well, if you go to law school, don't do that. <laughs> they, they don't appreciate it. In fact, my worst class of all was, was legal ethics, because <laughs> lawyers, they do the same thing with ethics, you know, A to B, they creep along, you know, and I'm thinking, Okay, any ethics worth its salt has got to be based on the law of love, right? I mean, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, A to Z, Alpha, the Omega, you know, embrace the whole <laughs> I nearly flunked legal ethics. I got a D. <laughs> well, the only class I did well in was torts. Now, that's not a baking class. I, I wish it had been. I wish I did really well in that. But no, torts is the, the fine art of suing rich people who are behaving badly and giving all their money to poor people. I got that. I really got that. No, don't get me wrong. I don't hate rich people. I love rich people. I love everybody. But, but if you're behaving badly, you know, you've got to pay. Now, when I graduated, I couldn't get a job. I, I wanted to be a lawyer for poor people, but no legal aid organization wanted me. You know, they were looking for people from the community who spoke Spanish, which of course makes perfect sense, but that wasn't me. And you know, to tell the truth, I wasn't really trying that hard to get a job because I thought, well, you know, if I don't get this job, there's a hundred people in line behind me. One of them's going to get it, and they'll do just as well or better than I. And so, you know, it doesn't really matter. And what I really, really wanted to do, you know, this I had this passion that I wanted to go where people were most forgotten, most neglected, most despised, had no voice at all. And so that's how we ended up in, in a garage in Skid Row, you know, representing homeless people and, and slum dwellers. And, uh, you know, this week I, I had to... I swallowed my gum along with everybody else when Facebook bought, you know, WhatsApp for $19 billion, you know, and I thought, whoa, you know, how far have we come? Because when I first started my practice, I had one piece of technology. It was a manual typewriter, and um, how, you made, how I made copies for the court is I got two pieces of paper, and I put a piece of carbon paper in between them, which is kind of like a sticky ink, you know? 
and then you type on that, and it makes that carbon copy, you know, on the... But the only problem is if you make one mistake, you have to rip it all out and start over because there's no way to correct a carbon copy. You know? So I was living in the shelter with my clients, and um, the shelter was able to pay me $3 a week uh, for my services, and, and so I used that for bus fare to get to court, and also for pantyhose because um, uh, in those days, women couldn't go to court wearing slacks. So you had to wear a skirt, and if you went without pantyhose on, you should have, yeah, I mean, you could just walk in naked. I mean, it, it was that bad, you know. So I blew my $3 every week on you know, bus fare and, and pantyhose. Now, um, I want to talk to you about the elephants in the room. You know, I, when I was asked to be here, I knew that I'd have to talk about the elephant because the time has passed when we can give happy little talks, you know, about helping the world. And I know I don't have to go into a great uh, detail with you all because you all know, I know, that we are uh, committing ecocide. Uh, we are blindly rushing into a future where global warming and social disruption and the inability of disintegrating societies to maintain their nuclear plants is going to render the planet unhabitable for us and, and, and for most of life. Uh, we're well underway in this process. We're passing tipping points as if they were dominoes, you know, falling over. Um, just this Thursday, I read a report from UC Berkeley. Uh, and the labs up there have found huge amounts of radioactive cesium in the alfalfa hay, which is being used as dairy feed in California to feed um, cows. And so they're saying, you know, there's only one way that this amount of radioactive cesium could have gotten into plants in California, and that's through the Fukushima uh, ongoing nuclear disaster. You know, it's not only poisoning the fish, it's, it's coming over here in our rain and our, our air and going into the ground. So even if you're a, you know, a, a raw food, vegan, organic eating person, um, you are at risk. I also uh, read an article Thursday about uh, a big spike, a huge spike in the state of Washington in uh, babies who are born, being born with anencephaly, where you know they're missing part of their brains. And the experts are going, well, well, why are we seeing this huge spike in these births? What's going on? What's going on? Well, I can tell you one thing that causes anencephaly, and that's uh, nuclear contamination. You know, when we, when we uh, drop the bombs with uh, depleted uranium in Iraq, there was a huge spike in these kinds of births there. I remember reading an article of women who were getting pregnant and were terrified when they became pregnant because so many of them were giving birth to these pitiable, you know, little monsters. And then, uh, just as a Friday afternoon, of course, there was an ongoing nuclear disaster in going on in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Uh, you may have heard about that. They, there's a nuclear waste disposal plant there. There was a fire. It's uncontained. Uh, as of uh, Friday afternoon, it was spewing plutonium into the atmosphere. Now plutonium is the single most poisonous uh, substance on Earth. Uh, if you inhale one one millionth of a gram, you know, you'll get lung cancer. You know, the song that's popular now, the Imagine Dragon song is radioactive. It's a very prophetic song. So seeing this terrible, you know, locomotive of disaster, how the hell do we get up in the morning and go out and do our little project? How do I get up and go do Uncommon Goods little projects? The Napier projects? The Pilgrim Place projects? What's the point? You know, when we look at what's happening to the environment, it looks probable that, you know, in our lifetimes, it's all going to be over. Or it'll be such a hot mess that we, we really won't want to be here. So what do we do in the face of this terrible knowledge? Well, some people say, you know, don't worry, the second coming is coming. Um, other people say, well, you know, the people that matter will be hoovered up into heaven and the rest of you will fry, you know. I don't find that terribly comforting. Um, some people my age, you know, uh, say, well, you know, the world is dying, we're all dying. Uh, think of it as a giant hospice, you know, and we'll all just be kind to each other and take care of each other as best we can while we all die, you know. Now, if you're very stoic and you're closer to the end of your life than the beginning, that might be comforting, but it's going to be comforting to you guys. No. And so, when I was asked to give this talk a year ago, I really didn't want to, I, because I didn't really have any hope. I thought, 
you know, the only hope for our world to survive or any part of our ecosystem to survive is that all of a sudden human beings would rapidly evolve into the, you know, kind of consciousness that could understand that yes, we are all one interconnected web of life and start acting accordingly. And like, you know, like that's going to happen, right? And so I thought, well, what can I say to these people that would both be honest and yet not soul crushing? So I've been thinking about it, and I've been on quite a quest this last year, trying to find some source of hope, some source of realistic hope. And I think I found something. And I want to share it with you because you know we're all going to need hope when we look at what's coming, you know, down the, the pipe on us. And and it's three things actually that I've learned in this past year that taken together have given me some realistic hope for the first time in a long time. And forgive me, you know, if you already know this stuff, I don't know whether teaching in knowledge these days, so you guys may already know this, but, but it was new to me, and so I thought, well, maybe it would be new to some of you too. So the question is, can there be a rapid evolutionary change in human consciousness that will spur a tipping point of the population to take enough planetary action uh, to save our world? Now, the first thing that I learned that began to give me hope was some of the things that we're learning about the nature of consciousness. What is conscious awareness? And neuroscientists and physicists are coming up with some startling answers uh, to that question. Um, and they're demonstrating that the brain is not the creator of consciousness. You know, we're not isolated units walking around with our own private little consciousnesses within the confines of our brains and our skulls, you know. Um, and instead, scientists say that no, our brains are, are more like antennas. And they're receiving and filtering information from a larger field of consciousness to which everyone appears to have shared access. Now, if you haven't taken physics since the old Newtonian model, you know, physics was being taught, this blows your mind, literally, right out of your brain, right out of your skull. In rigorously controlled scientific experiments in laboratories, scientists are discovering that when people access this common field of consciousness, they can communicate mentally across any distance, so let me, they can influence events across any distance. And they can even influence events in the past, in the future. Now trust me, I would not be talking about this if it was New Age woo-woo. This is science today. And the field of consciousness in which our minds dip in and out is non-local in space and time. Consciousness is not tethered to a physical location, to our brain, but it seems to function in an eternal now as opposed to linear time. So this field of consciousness has access to the past, the present, and the future, and the boundaries that we thought we knew between the past, the present, and the future are eroding. Folks, this is Einstein's spooky action at a distance Apparently, science was starting to point in this direction during Einstein's lifetime, and he was freaked out by it. He didn't want to accept it. He said, this is too weird for me. It's spooky action at a distance. I, I don't want any of it. But he had to admit that that's where things were headed. Well, now, apparently, Einstein's spooky action at a distance is, is scientific fact. Now, you know, maybe you know this stuff, but if this is new to you and your brain is spinning, um, a good uh, summary of the recent science in this area is a book that was published last year called One Mind uh, by Dr. Uh, Larry Dossie. Now, the second thing that I learned is that apparently there's no such thing as matter. That when you get down to the tiniest, tiniest particle of what we think of as matter, it's not matter at all, it's a whirling vortex of energy. And each of these whirling vortexes of energy is reacting with others in a connected energetic field. So everything is actually energy, um, from rocks to humans. Whole creation is a whirling, interactive mass of interconnected energy. So solidity, matter, 
is, is something of an illusion. Boundaries are an illusion. You know, apparently there's no scientific way to tell where my hand ends and this podium begins because there's no solid boundary. You know, the energy is, is all interacting with each other. So science seems to be proving what mystics have always said, which is that we are actually one. We really actually are one energetic field. Or actually science is proving what pagans have always said, which is the whole creation is actually one um, energetic field. Now, the third thing that I learned is how humans are accessing Consciousness. Now hang in there with me, it's all going to come together in a few minutes, okay? Um, how humans are accessing consciousness. Now, just a little bio recap. You know, we all know the humans have a DA system in which each strand looks like a twisted ladder, you know, that famous, that famous image that we've all seen. And our DNA is comprised of segments of proteins that communicate with each other. You know, I think of it as kind of a link of sausages, you know, connected sausages. And um, this is how they've been observed to communicate in the past, okay? Um, we, we have an experience. We have a, you know, we feel something, we have an emotion. And our RNA picks up signals from our electromagnetic system and then communicates that information through the segments of proteins in a linear chain reaction. So like from sausage A to sausage B to sausage C, you know, how the information goes. But the last couple of years, scientists have started to document that the RNA is behaving differently in children and, and even in some adults. And it's doing two things differently. First of all, it's picking up a broader spectrum of information from our electromagnetic field, which, as remember we talked about before, isn't confined strictly to the body. And so it's gathering more information from our bodies and the environment. And when it's communicating this information to our DNA, it's not, no longer communicating it linearly from A to B to C. It's jumping all over the DNA ladder in a non-linear, holistic fashion. Now, this means two things. First, Maybe what was wrong with me in law school is I had the wrong kind of RNA. <laughs> Second, it appears that humanity is being rewired. That we're evolving to be able to access more information about reality and process it in a more holistic way. In other words, with greater insight. Now, this rewiring is a major leap in our evolution as consciously aware human beings. And as this is being observed by scientists in the laboratories, more people in the population are spontaneously experiencing higher states of conscious awareness at a rate that just a few years ago was unheard of. So maybe we are evolving into human beings that can grasp that we are part of a great web of life. Now, after learning this stuff and putting it all together and realizing the implications, I became very excited. And for the first time in a long time, more hopeful. But I also wondered if I was crazy. Because you know, I'm not a scientist. And I thought, maybe I'm reading this stuff and just reading into what I really want. To, to believe, you know, because I need hope so badly, you know. Well, we have a guy on our board who's a neuroscientist. Uh, he was the, the vice chair of uh, neurosurgery and neuroscience at Loma Linda University Medical Center. And so I called him up and I said, well, I, I really need to talk to you. And so we got together and, and I told him what I just told you. And I said, I need to know if I'm interpreting this information correctly. Do the results of these studies really show that consciousness is non-local in space and time? And our brains can download information from a vast, apparently unlimited field of consciousness? And he said, yes, that, that uh, seems to be what the science is showing us. And I said, okay, 
Well, if our RNA is being observed to pick up a broader spectrum of electromagnetic information, and communicating it in a, a new, holistic way throughout our bodies, would this signify a major evolution in humans' ability to be consciously aware? And he said, yes, it does. And so then I said, well, okay. If everything, us included, is made up of energy, what is this energy? Is it consciousness? Is it the life of God? I mean, what, what is this? And he said, it's love. Well, I was stunned to hear a scientist say this. Because that's exactly what I had come to believe in the depths of my heart over a lifetime. When I was young, you know, I had this burning desire to serve the most forgotten. And I followed this great fire, this great light. But I didn't know what it was inside me. I didn't know if it was a rage against injustice, or if it was a rage against suffering, or sorrow for the pain of the world, you know. But after a time, I started to understand, you know, what it was. It was just love. And if I faithfully followed this great flame pouring out of my heart, that I might end up in some unlikely places, but the work would unfold. And help would come. People would come to help me. Money would come. Ideas would come. And I experienced love as the great power source of the universe, the open secret of the universe. Now, when I started this evening, I said that the students here who didn't win anything are the most powerful people in this room. And now I want to tell you why I think that. You also have this great fire burning inside of you. You've become consciously aware of it, and you're starting to follow it. Of course you have, or you wouldn't be here with your great dear dreams of saving the world. Now, those of us who are older in this room also have that fire in us, but frankly, you know, we've used up a lot of our lot of time and energy. <laughs> well, you have it all stretched out before you. And, secondly, you don't have the distraction of a monetary award. And, <laughs> I'm very serious. What I mean by that is that if, you've gotten, if you had gotten one of these awards, you would be stuffed into your little Napier project box. <laughs> and if something bigger, wilder, grander, nobler, crazier came along and called to you, you wouldn't be able to follow it. You know, you've made a commitment and you'd be within your little box and you'd have to just keep going. You know, I can't tell you how many times in my life I've made a little plan and thought I was going to do something. And the universe swooped in and made a hard right turn and all of a sudden I was involved in something much bigger, grander, crazier, wilder, more wonderful than anything I ever could have imagined on my own. I think those of you who didn't win the awards tonight, I think the universe has something much bigger. In mind. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, you have access to the common field of consciousness, which apparently is unlimited in time and space, and so therefore you are unlimited in time and space. So, so don't be afraid of, of the coming darkness. I think if you just follow the deepest promptings of your heart, and don't worry about the money, you know, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to sleep. Just follow your heart's passion and help will follow you. That's the way it works. Will there be suffering? Well, sure. You know, yours and, and other people's. But love is so much, so much stronger than suffering that, that you'll, you'll be okay. You, you may end up in some unlikely places, you know, a, a garage in Skid Row, a, a prison cell in South Africa, stable in Bethlehem. You know, the, the powers that be may never acknowledge you, may never notice you, but that will be okay. Because I know, I'm certain, 
that wherever you are will be a very powerful and a very sacred place because you are there and you are enough. when the liberal agenda was being formed, Joy and Davy Napier publicly enunciated it, and they began challenging those around them to adopt it. That agenda had the assault on racial segregation as its centerpiece, and underscored the relationship of that awful reality to the war to Vietnam. Discussion was taking hold on the growing destruction of the environment. And the neighbors began to rally what they called the defense of the earth in all its aspects as the third intermingled term. Poverty and inequality, economic inequality, was also recognized as the cancer it's become for the body politic. Now these four elements and other related items were the essence of the neighbor agenda. They began the steady deepening of their commitment to making the amelioration of these terrible realities the heart of their work, irrespective of public reaction to their commitment. They were splendidly positioned with a bully pulpit. They had been a chaplain, they had been a teacher, been a Yale house master, chaplain again at Stanford, president of the Pacific School of Religion, and so they were never without that agenda. They spoke, they wrote, they organized and pushed, pushed, pushed. They pursued the goals, the sum of which was the making of a fairer world. If you had to put it in a sentence, what, 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 what was the Napier agenda? The making of a fairer world. And they pursued that agenda to the very end of their days. Now, it was their work with young people, particularly those that claims our attention tonight, when we think of the neighbors. They never wavered, steadily blending their consciousness to this liberal agenda and focusing themselves unerringly on this work. You weren't fully alive, they insisted unless you became actively engaged in the effort which offered a framework that they pursued for their entire lives is the heart of the framework of genuine advocacy. So that in particular is why our recipient tonight of the fourth Napier Medal stands like her predecessors at the center of this Napier legacy. She's taken on so many of the very same social issues that the Napiers cared about. Just to name a few. Legal aid for the poor and homeless and the prosecution of slumlords who exploit them. Environmental sustainability, both because environmental hazards affect the poor and dramatic changes are needed for, in that area for long-term sustainability. A prime example of that kind of pressure is the years of work and permitting struggles that led to permission to build a new uncommon good office building. You've heard about it already tonight. A creative prototype of the new generation of earth-friendly buildings. Though she perse uh, persevered today, through that perseverance, that has become a striking reality. Both our medical education debt relief program and the Connect to College program are aimed at the most underprivileged populations, often minority young people, designed to empower them to play a positive and constructive role in society. Our urban farming program gives them employment and provides fresh produce in areas where both are scarce. Her work, steady, deep, innovative, enduring, 
serves the most disadvantaged throughout the Southland. A fundamental feature of these activities on which she concentrates is the unique way that they engage students, <coughs> particularly college students, to work with other young people. Some of this year's very Napier fellows have worked with Uncommon Good and learned from these programs as they devise, ser devise service programs of their own. Now, Nancy is a strange paradox. On the one hand, she's more hands-on direct, direct, directly, in organizing and administering creative new programs than the Napiers. But she shares their prophetic vision, their unending excitement that this work has to be done, and their contagious commitment to engage others in the work. She's a remarkable example of what the Napiers call the creative leadership for social change, which the Napier Initiative is designed to foster. Nancy Minty wonderfully embodies the Napier Initiative, and that is why we're pleased beyond telling tonight to bestow on you, Nancy M Minty, the 214 Napier Medal. low-income and low-resource families. 
In collaboration with those families, she proposes to start a reading initiative at the community garden for their children to help them master the English language and develop their communication skills. Lindsay yeah. Lee. in the management of diabetes, seeing art as a medium for emotional healing that medical treatment alone cannot provide. She proposes to share this perspective with people living with diabetes in New England and also in Bangalore, India, to, in collaboration with local agencies. Thank you. Marilyn Ross, Ross. <laughs> Reflecting on a visit to a public school in a seriously disadvantaged neighborhood of East St. Louis and on what she had learned about the relationship of poverty and poor education to mass incarceration well, Maryland is shaping plans for a Good Start program in East St. Louis. Her goal is to empower the community to improve <coughs> educational achievement, starting with the youngest students and their families, making their first school experience a positive one. Thank you. Thank you. The next project had two people with it, Bianca Shu and Sharon Jan. <laughs> Out of their experience working with several educational nonprofits where they saw a need for improving children's writing, Sharon and Bianca have developed a highly successful weekly writing workshop, 3W program. College students mentor, mentors work with underprivileged school children using the 3W curriculum to develop their technical writing skills and creative expression. Bianca and Sharon propose to develop an already emerging national network with two national training conferences for college mentors to strengthen teaching skills and help students set up their own sustainable 3W programs. Christian Stevens. Stephen is from Harvey Mudd College, and he's been working on HIV gene therapy research in the lab for two years, and has volunteered in the community, learning of the social impact of HIV. He proposes to go to the Long Way, Malawi, where there is a high incidence of HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, all infections that require strict adherence to medication programs. He plans to work with healthcare professionals and patients trying to understand and deal with the factors that affect medication adherence in order to improve healthcare outcomes for patients. She proposes to partner with the Vietnamese program Be Change Agents 
that gathers university students to teach leadership skills. She wants to expand that program by incorporating interactive skill building and a curriculum for students to teach this material to other students. The program will be customized by drawing on the knowledge of both students and experienced practitioners in social change. Mitsuko Yami. Mitsuko is from Pomona College, and she's been doing genomic research on snow leopards, endangered species, to discover how climate change would affect their adaptation to high altitude environments in the humble Himalayas of India. Mitsuko proposes to go to La Dhaka. Thank you. <laughs> to work with the, the main education coordinator of the Snow Leopard Conservancy, India Trust, to develop and include a climate change section in their environmental education program. <coughs> she also hopes to establish a platform for long-term, mutually beneficial relationships between the trust and American academic institutions to bridge, bridge the cultural gap between American scientists and the people of Lana. The Lana. Excuse me. We need to add, uh, with a great regret, that Catherine Garcia of Pomona College, Jen Livermore of Scripps College, and Margaret Thompson of Harvey Mudd College were unable to be present this evening because of conflicting responsibilities. And you can read more about all these students in the program. Let's give them all a hand. We have present this evening two former Napier awardees. I would like to recognize Takako Mino, who received an award our very first year. You can read a little about her work in East Africa in the program. She was back in Claremont in a master's program in education and gave a wonderful talk to the Napier Fellows in November. She has helped us in many ways with the ongoing program, and we are grateful for her friendship and her continuing role as a colleague. Topico, will you stand so we can recognize you? We have asked Caitlin Watkins, who received an award last year, to say a word of welcome to the new Napier Fellows. She has come from San Francisco to be with us, and we are also grateful for her friendship and continuing relationship to the Napier Initiative. You can read about Caitlin's work in, with Women of Crossroads in the program. Caitlin? Beautiful network we have here. 
and hopes that you won't lose that spark, that spark of controversy and that aim at social justice and environmental stewardship. So, here we go. Number one, please remain confident in your personal mission, and most importantly, in yourself. Remember, failure is definitely inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> Always question everything, especially authority. This is number two. Don't forget to ask for help or to seek advice or mentorship um, from those who you admire and respect. Lastly, but not least, continue to continuously reflect. In the classroom setting and definitely in the Native Your Fellows program, there are so many opportunities and ample time to ponder issues that we're facing in our projects. Um, please continue to do so because after graduation, you have to remain true to yourself and to your own values, and it's, it's kind of difficult, um, I've learned. So, last of all, I want to wish all of you the best of luck in your future endeavors, and thank you so much for having me here today. presenting this year's Napier Awards. As always, the selection committee has an enormously difficult task. They have fallen in love with every one of the nominees. The five colleges have already screened their applications and sent us only nominees that meet their standards. They all have great strengths academically and a remarkable breadth of experience as volunteers for social change. They all have presented creative proposals for projects that could make a significant contribution to a better world. So we happily honor them all as Napier Fellows and offer them mentoring and encouragement. We increased the number of awards from two to three this year, but alas, we cannot do more. So let me first introduce the two persons chosen as alternates for the award if awardees are unable to carry out their projects. They are Christian Stevens and Mitsuko Yabe. Bianca Shu and Sharon Jack. So, <laughs> so let's invite them to come forward, and we have invited each of them to say a word in response. Uh, 
um, in regards to our project, and we really had no idea about that because we weren't even friends before we started this journey. But um, I don't think I share the same eloquent speaking skill that she does. <laughs> so I don't have a quote, but as soon as she said hers, then I thought of one of mine because I thought it would be cool too. And so I remember that there was an Olympic hurdler who said, um, if we doubted our fears as much as we doubt our dreams, imagine all we could accomplish. And I think that that's very fitting for tonight because you don't have to be one of the winners, like um, Nancy had said, in order to accomplish your dreams. Like, don't let your fears get in the way. And so, I just I just want to say thanks to so many people, especially my family. Like, I have family members here that I know like took time out of their schedule to be here, and um, my kids are family too because like without their support, like they just have supported me the whole way. And so I'm ever grateful to Sandy and to Nigel. And also I have representatives here from the Garden, the um, organization that I'm going to be working with. And I'm so supportive of them too, or they're so supportive of me. And they've welcomed me into their community and into their families too, and just have faith in me. And so I hope that this project like, ends up being as great as I've envisioned in my head. <laughs>
We also hope that you will be able to share your plans as your plans emerge for the future. Even after graduation, we hope you will let us know what you are doing. We dream that a network may emerge where Napier fellows of different student generations, like Takako and Caitlin this evening, may connect with you to offer encouragement and support and perhaps wisdom from their experience in work similar to yours. And you can do the same for others. If you will stay in touch, we will try to facilitate this kind of networking through our website and Facebook page. We find strength for our work through this kind of solidarity, and we hope you might too. You stand in a long tradition of people from all sorts of backgrounds with many different careers who feel called to work for the common good of all humanity, to work for justice, peace, and sustainable care of the earth. We are grateful for your passion and your energy and your creativity in this work. Knowing your promise for leadership for social change gives us much hope. So, when the pickers are in place, let us sing along with them. If the pickers are there, uh, we shall overcome. Make her. 
if we would doubt our fears as much as we have doubted our dreams, then uh, there's no limit to what we can do. But I'm not paraphrasing. <laughs> we are not afraid. We are not afraid. We are not afraid today. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe. We are Thank you.